Let's go time. And we are live. Hello and welcome to the Grow Spot podcast, the show designed to help you grow yourself and your career. Each week, we'll be sharing stories from industry leaders to help you understand what actually goes into taking that next step. My name is Calvin Taloki, and I've spent about 20 years in the hospitality industry then to start my own uh, social media business. So I'm turned from employee to entrepreneur. And today we have Mr. Kyle Allison, the man behind Hospitality MD and also documentary producer extraordinaire. So Kyle, welcome to the spot. Today's episode is sponsored by We Tip Hotels. Don't you hate when you're checking out of your hotel or the valet is showing up with your car and you realize you have no cash? Don't you feel like a schmuck? Well, with We Tip Hotels, this doesn't have to happen anymore. With We Tip Hotels, you can set up a customized website where guests can tip from their phones and 100% goes directly to the hotel staff. And the best part is, it is free to sign up. Head over to WeTipHotels.com to start taking care of your employees. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so glad to be here. And I also just realized that I've been pronouncing your name, your last name wrong. <laughs> to your face in private, all over the place. It is not Tiloki, it is Tiloki. All right, I got it now. Never again. No worries, man. You know, I didn't even notice that you did that, but that is the most common way to mispronounce my name, but it's it's fine. I'm sure you're used to it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fine. You know what? I hate when people like swap the letters around. I get, you know, tickly and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, can you ah. just read, man? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm reading the letters. I'm just mispronouncing. mispronouncing. So Calvin Taloki. Awesome. Taloki. Nice to re-meet you, my friend, in the correct yeah. <laughs> You as well, buddy. You as well. So, um as uh, most of my audience may know, um, or they may not, but I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction. You know, Kyle is the man be- behind Hospitality MD. Uh, he made a meme during COVID that I sent to me, and that shit blew up on my page. <laughs> you know, I'm a one-hit uh, one wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I came to find out later that that was the only meme you've ever made, but uh, you definitely milli vanilli the hell out of that one. Um, <laughs> crushed it and uh yeah i I won't lie at first i was feeling some kind of way i'm like everybody's loving this meme i didn't even make it i was kind of jealous you know no Um, you know what i'm just glad that people got to see it because i i was actually like wow i think i have a really good meme but i'm not i I don't do this so let me just pass it on to to the, (laughs) the, the the man himself for distribution. I think it worked out great. I'm just glad to see that people enjoyed it. That was funny to everybody. It did. It did. It's hysterical. Uh, as I told you when I was in Chicago, um, I think it was like in my top, definitely my top 10 from the past year um, as far as likes. And so definitely knocked that one out of the park. But um, for for those who may not know, uh, let, let the audience know who you are and a bit about your background. Yeah. So I'm Kyle. As he mentioned, I... Uh, host hospitality md podcast we do different hospitality media stuff but mostly podcasts and youtube videos i uh also as mentioned just recently produced directed actually we do have another producer but i just directed um follow me and i will be behind you a feature length documentary film about the number one double tree by hilton hotel on the planet why it is number one the man behind the hotel um and it was just the pleasure of my life to put that together. Calvin was gracious enough to join us in Chicago for the premiere. So for those of you who haven't seen it, check out the trailer on Hospitality MD YouTube page. Uh, just search follow me and I will be behind you and you can see that. Um, and then we're putting the film into some film festivals and doing stuff with it and it should be nice. in your home soon, hopefully. And uh, other than that, um, I am just recently in my first week at as the general manager of the embassy suites by Hilton in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, which is the worst embassy suites on the planet, uh, ranked at uh, 256 out of 256 embassy suites hotels in their portfolio globally. So yeah, it's crazy. So we out here. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny when you told me that I didn't realize it was globally. I just I thought it was just uh, domestic. But. No, they they there's only 256 total embassy suites on the planet. It's a very small mm. brand, and uh, yeah, right here in Winston Salem, the worst one on the planet. So, and uh, I'm the guy behind it. So, right. <laughs> I'm not the reason it got here. Let's make let's. let's uh, yeah, I was going to say let's let's make sure to clarify. You only been there a week. <laughs> only been here one week. This is my second Monday, so I started last Monday, and here we are recording on a Monday evening. So, okay. just just basically the start of my second week here uh, as GM, and my goal is to fix this place. So, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing here from Chicago, though. So just moved um, mm. here, packed all my stuff into my car. Well, basically sold donated gave away most of my belongings and packed just a small couple of things and i'm living on property here at the hotel mm -hmm. and just making it work all right well if any of you guys who know uh anything about kylie you know that uh he's gonna make an impact there very shortly um but why don't we let's start at the at the beginning of your your hospitality uh career and then we'll we'll get to where you are now as a gm uh, where did this all start for you um, it started officially when I was 17 years old, uh, but I will say that it, to me, it started a little sooner. Um, when I was six, I turned my parents' house into a hotel. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, everybody else, all the kids were playing Pokemon cards, Yu-Gi-Oh, all this other stuff that was popular in my generation when we, we were younger. And, uh, and I was giving my parents daily stay over service in their bedroom <laughs> and uh had in-room dining menus that i mm. wrote you know pen and crayons and all that folded on their on their uh nightstands and everything like that um just waiting on them and just being hospitable and just being a hotelier if That's you know so funny. that was my that was my playtime uh yeah and it's now flash forward it's still my playtime uh, yeah. still, still what I do. So I will say that it, it you know, that it, it's runs deep within me. Um, mm -hmm. but it, again, it started when I was 17 for real, when I, when I got my first job as a front desk agent, um, at a hotel. So, um, going back to when you were six, where do you think you got that idea from? Like, did you see something on TV? Did you see a movie that kind of sparked this this idea uh, because it's it's not something that a lot of I, I would imagine a lot of kids start thinking about at six years old you know kids typically want you want to be a fireman a policeman you know um i know a story of a guy who started a brand called fortina um back in new york and he talked about you know wanted to cook and you could see that because you see your you see your, your family cook all the time so i could imagine that a six-year-old would envision themselves doing some of these different things. But unless you stayed, lived in a hotel, it's interesting that a six year old would have envisioned and no, even know what stay over service was. Well, my mom is a flight attendant. She has been for 38 years. Um, and I think traveling with her, uh, and really experiencing the entire just system of tourism and travel and from the, you know, airlines to staying in hotels um, really just excited me a lot um, as a kid, just for some inexplicable reason was very, very, very invigorating. Mm -hmm. And I remember becoming like sort of just really fascinated and kind of obsessed with just like different brands and like trying, trying to just figure it all out. Like, even just driving down the road and like passing like, you know, Hilton Garden Inn, for example, I'd start to like figure that brand out and just kind of see what's going on and like try to be, mm. I didn't know it at the time, but I'm like, oh, that's upper mid scale. And then I'd see like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Econo Lodge or Motel 6 and I'd be like, oh, that's an economy hotel. Like mm -hmm. not actually because I didn't know segmentation like that back then, but right. I was putting those pieces together Mm -hmm. without really knowing it back then and uh, having stayed at, at um, you know, a, quite a bit of hotels. And it's not like I was traveling every week, but 
I had experienced traveling and I felt like I was very in tune to that experience and very just kind of mesmerized with hotel operations. Um, so that's why I could pick up on like the things like stayover service or like the details of burbage and the interim dining menus and stuff like that, that like was actually very, mm -hmm. very, very fun for me even back then. Um, so it started with my mom, just her being in the hospitality industry um, mm -hmm. and just my excitement, learning about different brands and hotels. And um, yeah, it was just, it's, I can't, I can think back to as far as I remember. And I remember loving hotels for a long time. Right. Yeah. So you, so you, you did have some exposure to it, but the, it's, it's interesting, you know, and it's, you know, good for you that you've been able to, to hone in on that early and, and, and start your career pretty early. You know, um, I always remember this story. I was about maybe, I want to say maybe about eight or nine years old. Right. And I had, uh, remember looking at TV and paying attention to the commercials. And I was like, there's a lot of commercials that are geared towards girls. And this here's this nine year old, I go get a notebook and I start paying attention to when the commercials come on and I made a check for every one for male or female as I'm watching my cartoons throughout the day. <laughs> and then at the, <laughs> the end of the day, I look and I'm like, it was, I don't, I didn't look at thinking percentage at that point, but I was like, Okay, it was maybe 80% female and 20% geared towards boys. And as a nine-year-old, I was probably like, oh my God, this isn't fair, you know? But now, because I've branched off more into marketing, I think about that experience and I'm like, you've you've had a marketing brain your whole life, right? But you just never paid attention to it. And now, obviously, you know that, well, women do most of the purchasing, Right. And that's why a lot of these commercials will be geared towards girls or females. But you wouldn't have known that at nine years old. But it's 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 great that you you were able to very quickly in your life kind of attach your way where you where you should be, right? You know, the, the thing that sparked the passion in you at a very early age and you did it, as opposed to many of us who end up doing a lot of other things and then you figure it out later in life, if or not at all for some people. Or you don't, right? Um, right. And I love that story, by the way, man. That just hypes me <laughs> up so much. Uh, because, like, it's just, you can see it. Like, it's what you were made to do. And, like, it's moments like that, you know, uh, the enunciation moment, as I refer to it, and as I learned from a, a book called Second Mountain by David Brooks. And mm -hmm. he basically says that enunciation moment is a moment that usually happens when you're a kid that is essentially, uh, you know, anointing you into your, um, your passion or your calling or something that really mm -hmm. makes you happy. And a lot of times during adolescence and as things start to pile up in your life, you might lose that or you might lose sight of it, or maybe you never knew what it was. Um, right. But typically if you, you'll find your way back to it or again, you don't. And if you don't, well, chances are you might find yourself feeling bitter or resentful or something of that nature um, as a result of, of not attaching yourself to that enunciation moment. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's it sounds like that was your enunciation moment. And then, I, you know, I've had mine going out with my mom and, and being in hotels and airlines and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I definitely feel very lucky and I'm consciously aware of how lucky I am to have found it, to recognize it and to have acted on it. Um, because I, that's not my fault, right? That's just something that right. happens to me. And that's, I definitely feel that that's a component of my career success is being very sure in what I'm doing and, and knowing this makes sense for me. This is what I feel I feel I'm at my best when I'm doing this. And that's right. a luxury not everybody has. So I feel very blessed very true. about that. Yeah, very true. Very true. Um, you got to uh, you gotta give us the name of that book again. Because that first, of all, I want to read it, but I definitely want to yeah. share that. It is one of the best books I've ever read, Second Mountain by David Brooks. And yeah, just read it. Enjoy it. Guys, if you're listening, go to Amazon, buy the book. It's great. Um, it's basically just, 
how to uh, uh, your first mountain is very egotistical in a way you're mm -hmm. climbing your ladder because you think you have to and it's what society tells you you want to do and typically that mountain is followed by a, a valley period of like i mentioned bitterness resentment despair depression whatever that looks like a, a low moment for you and mm -hmm. then you can climb yourself out of that point by attaching yourself to something meaningful to you or something that is of service to others um, and that's your second mountain the more meaningful one and you can find that with um, your occupation you can find that by attaching yourself to a responsibility for family or charity or religion or whatever that is for you uh, you can help yourself um, climb that second mountain really really yeah. great that's awesome man i mean well i think a lot of us are probably in that phase right now. I know I am personally, you know, You're on your um, I, I, I believe so. I mean, I, uh, I had a long, long career in, in hospitality, which I, I enjoyed, you know, but I do feel that, you know, I guess you would say that Valley, that low point was, was COVID and then being laid off. And it's forced me into, into starting my own company, something that I had an ideas about over say maybe the last three or four years of my career, I started, you know, taking, uh, taking root in my brain of this is what I would do. And I think over the past year, having started it, spent so much time doing it, I'm coming to find out that, um, yeah, this is more of my calling. And I think this podcast is part of it is it's, it's helping people, right? It's, it's, um, this, this, this arm of what I do here, I think is to help people have a smoother career than I did. You know, um, I've, 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 I've had some, some bumps in the road and I, there's things that I wish I knew, um, then as, as we all do, right. They say youth is wasted on the young. Right. And, um, you know, true wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. So hopefully, you know, we get to do that through this show, but I think, you know, I have a natural affinity to people and, and storytelling, which is what I try to do through, through social media. And, um, it seems very fluff when you, you hear it that way. Oh, it's Instagram. But you know what? I think if you do it right, you you can really connect with people. Um, I know I know I have on ref problems over the years. I I took a trip to Europe a couple of years ago and people saw my stories and invited me out for beers. I'm in the middle of Barcelona, you know, and it was like it was nuts to me. Yeah, I was like, I started out doing this, just make cracking some jokes and here I am able to connect with people halfway across the globe because we have shared experiences, you know? So I think that power of social media, that ability to connect with people is, um, yeah, I think that's my second mountain is creating that for a lot of people, you know, but this show is not about me. The show's about you. Well, I'm just <laughs> glad to know you're in the second mountain because like, that's just awesome, man. I love to hear that. I'm just glad to see you doing good. Yeah, I, I appreciate you, man. Um, so let, let's get back to you're 17 years old. You get your yep. job at the front desk. Uh, how does how did that go? And then where does it go from there? Yeah, so uh, that was return to the enunciation moment at that point in time because again, adolescence, extracurriculars, school, everything was just existing. So I didn't really think anything of it. Um, and sure enough, my mom applied for that job for me, mm -hmm. for that hotel job, because she knew my enunciation moment, I think subconsciously, and she made that decision to apply for me. So I got the call from HR that said, hey, we're, we're bringing you in for an interview. And I just said, okay, sure. And then I said, do you know anything about this? And she said, yeah, I applied for you. <laughs> um, and I got hired um, by my now partner in hospitality md greg he was my first boss oh wow hired me. yeah yeah he hired me uh no experience 17 years old and i basically just started doing my thing started being hospitable um started taking accountability for the guests and really remembering remembering my experiences traveling made me more empathetic to the guests who are who are uh, coming in, made me more empathetic to kids who is who are staying, because I would always think, and I still do, this kid coming in with their parents to stay at the hotel could be like could be like me. They could be mm -hmm. a kid who's thinking, 
wow, like these little nuances in the operation or oh, I think we're staying at, a, at an upper at an upper mid scale or, or full service hotel. Like they're starting to think these things in their mind. Um, mm. And that could be their enunciation moment when they're staying with me at my hotel um, right. or for anybody really. So I really take that seriously. And that's one of the things that I think helped me out when I first started out at front desk. I just wanted to give great service. I just wanted to be there for the guests. And, um, you know, also I, I started kind of emerging as a, as a leader amongst the, the front desk agents. And, you know, I was promoted to front office supervisor. Um, so I was in high school, I was going to school, getting off, coming in for my PM MOD shift. And then I would stay until midnight, 1 AM, whenever, whenever everything was wrapped up, then probably sleep through first period. And my mom would <laughs> me eventually make it to school and just, then on the weekends do Saturday PM MOD, Sunday AM MOD and just do it and just started immersing mm -hmm. myself in the industry as a high school student and like doing it, I would say pretty much for real at that point. Like I felt like my career was already in full motion before I graduated high school, um, being a supervisor, doing those MOD shifts and um, getting to really just get intimate with the hotel industry in that way. Um, so from there, I actually went to college for like eight months. I went to University of Iowa because it was already like decided before I really died, dove into my hotel career. Um, but I remember telling my parents before, like a couple of weeks before I was supposed to leave, like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I think I just want to stay here and I want to keep doing what I'm doing. And they mm -hmm. said, no, you got to go. You're going to try it. You're going to see what it's like. So I went to University of Iowa. I got a job at a hotel in Iowa, full service, uh, corporate managed Marriott hotels and resorts property, um, which was the nicest hotel in this, in Coralville, Iowa. It was the market leader. Um, mm -hmm. they did a, they did a great job, but I was working there and then basically partying and having fun when I wasn't, um, wasn't going to class, didn't care. So eventually dropped out, came back to Chicago. I wanted to play with the big dogs uh, in the city proper, you know, because but my first job was in the suburbs of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I started working as a housekeeping supervisor at a embassy suites, Chicago downtown. Um, and then I linked back up with Greg who hired me uh, at the Wit Hotel. And I took a step back to be a front desk agent again, after having been a supervisor at two hotels in front office and a housekeeping supervisor at one but i took a step back to be with greg again and to kind of learn four diamond front office operations and just because it just didn't matter i was just going to take a step back and you know that kind of propelled my career but within a short time i was assistant front office manager there um mm -hmm. and uh yeah i was assistant front office manager there. I went to the Drake Hotel, 100 years old, 535 rooms to be front office manager there. While I was there, I did some task force, um, one of which is director of rooms at the Hilton Oakland Airport, and then another one at the Hilton San Diego Bayfront, uh, which is 1,190 rooms. And uh, yeah, then I became a department head for the first time at Hilton's at McCormick Place, which is a, the nation's first and Chicago's only triple branded hotel. So one front desk, three elevator banks, vertical, and each hotel was kind of vertical within those elevator banks, all within the same box. Um, oh, wow. The Hilton Garden Inn, Hampton Inn, and Home Two Suites, but 466 rooms connected to by Skybridge to McCormick Place Convention Center, which is the largest convention center in the Western Hemisphere. So I was a uh, department head there for the first time. Um, and then I went back to the WIT as front office manager right before COVID, um, mm. which ended up working out because Hilton's and McCormick Place shut down right away and my and the WIT stayed open. So I was able to extend the lifespan of my uh, hospitality career for a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was manager on duty during the uh chicago riots when george floyd passed away and the protests mm. and everything. so my hotel was actually um looted at that point and then after that the hotel closed and i was let go um from there um 
and yeah, and then I really was diving in on Hospitality MD, which is something that I've been had been doing for a few years up until this point, but mm-hmm. really just started taking it seriously. I reached out to Craig Poole, who's now my mentor and the subject of the documentary, who now you know, um, and I asked him if I could come and learn about his hotel because I knew that it was number one. I knew he was doing great things. And he said, yeah, just come on over. So I went there for several weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, Didn't think I was going to film a documentary, but just did while I was there. Um, Learned a lot from him and his team. And then, um, you know, me kind of doing that. And that kind of actually led me to getting this general manager job because Mm -hmm. the owner of my hotel heard about this and Craig actually got on a Zoom call with me and the owner and basically said, if you have a struggling hotel, this guy gets it and he can help you. And uh, and that's kind of my career in a nutshell. I've been in this mm-hmm. industry for six years and this is my 10th hotel. I've jumped around yeah. a lot, wow. a, lot yeah. of, a lot of stuff, 10 hotels. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think I might be roughly around that. And I, I was in 20 years, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I know that's like, interesting. I've been, I've gotten a lot of criticism about mm-hmm. my career from a lot of people. I will say that. So I don't mind if anybody wants to shoot bullet holes. It's okay, because right. um, I really don't regret it. Um, I've got, I've had a lot of people who said, "Oh, you didn't stay at this job for long enough, or you didn't do this right, or you should have done this." Mm-hmm. I don't care. I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you know what? This the, you've you've raised a couple of really good points here. I want to go back to one you 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 were uh, you you raised for me when you were talking about your career and that point where you said you went back to Greg uh, and you you said you took a step back to learn Ford Diamond, but also just because, right? Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> that that's a point I, I want to uh, touch on with you a little bit because a lot of people wouldn't do that. A lot of people are really worried about this taking a backward step. And the thing is, it felt right for you, right? It did. It did. Yeah. And a lot of times you don't know. It's kind of like a rubber band, right? Like you pull it back a bit, but you go back, you you, you go forward. Sometimes you need to take a little bit of a step back, but if you know what you want, that can springboard you into something so much better. You could have stayed where you were. You could have passed over that opportunity and said, well, I'm only need to go forward from here, but you may not be where you are now. I would not be. I 100% would not be. And you're so right. I love that rubber band analogy because, yeah, I took a little step back. um, But it seriously was like explosive from that point forward. Right. Um, And it was just like from that. I seriously from that job, um, my, my last job that I applied to was the housekeeping supervisor role at the embassy suite, Chicago downtown. That was right before mm-hmm. I went back to the wit or went to the wit for the first time to work with Greg and took that step back. I took that step back. And from that point forward, I never applied for another job. I just kept getting recruited, eaten mm-hmm. up, just people just hitting me up. Hey, come over here and do this. Come over here and do that. Right. Hey, we're going to send you on task force here. Now we're sending you on task force here. Just, I didn't do any, I just, did my thing and people came to me from that point forward. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. Not only did it feel right, but it totally exploded from that point forward. Um, and, and I think that's a, that's a good point too, is I, I mean, at the end of the day, it was like, I was a housekeeping supervisor, not to say that wasn't like glamorous or anything, but mm-hmm. it, it wasn't like I was a, a director of operations going back to uh to front desk agent, but still a a, a step back to learn. And I think Mm -hmm. it's not about, I I had worked at mediocre hotels up until that point. The wit Mm -hmm. was a hotel that actually had a culture of excellence. Mm -hmm. um, And was, while I was there, we became the number two double tree by Hilton hotel in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, So there to know not only do you know problems when you you know you see them at other hotels, but it's not enough to know problems. You need to see how a well-run hotel looks, yeah. um, and that was what I accomplished there, and that's why it felt right. Because Greg had told me this place is doing something really different, really special. You know, you'd really 
enjoy this culture. You'd love to see it. And I took his word mm-hmm. for it. It was very true. And I think, uh, you know, not not in title, but just in culture was important for my development. Right. Yeah. No, that's again, man, you, you're raising some really good points. You know, you, you, you took a step back because you you knew there was something there that it had something to offer you a different experience. And, you know, again, because you knew where you wanted to go, being a housekeeping supervisor is great, but you had done front office at at that point at a, you know, at your, well, front desk, all right? So you did front desk and then you're doing housekeeping. Now you get the opportunity to go into a place that's for Diamond, deliver an excellent service. So what? You take a slight knock in your title, but you've gained so much more in experience, which then opened up so many more doors for you afterwards. And, and it did, yeah. And mm-hmm. also, just knowing people too—that was a huge part of it as well. That, that's yeah. That's the other part I was going to bring up because now you've this is your second go around with Greg. He clearly knows uh, what you're about, how you work, and it's maintaining those relationships. Uh, it's something that's kind of been a common theme throughout all of the episodes so far. Is people talk about that? That's a huge part of building a career is maintaining and curating these relationships with with people and. Obviously, you, you, your work needs to speak. I mean, Greg could have liked you, but if you were a shitty employee, he probably wasn't calling you that second time, right? You know? Oh, yeah. No, he, <laughs> I think it's safe to say that, uh, you know, he, he thought I was okay, okay enough to hire me with no experience the first time and then okay to bring me back. Um, really where his reputation was on the line at a four diamond hotel and bring me on board to his team. Um, And that was, that was meaningful. Uh, That was meaningful. And then also to, to advocate for my growth and to promote me and stuff. So it was, you know, I knew I had somebody who was in my corner and it was good to kind of keep going down that rabbit hole a little bit. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and, you know, align yourself with somebody that um, can be an advocate for you, but something else you just said too is, you know, um, your your job is to make your boss look good, right? Mm, yep. And from what the, the comment you made, sounds like you understood that you're. You know, he's he's taking a chance on you. It's up to you to deliver and make sure he doesn't look like an idiot at the end of this. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and I really respected that um, that duty. I took that seriously. Where I'm like, Greg's going out on a limb for me here. Mm-hmm. He's making sure I get promoted. He's, you know, bringing me to these different hotels um, and I'm going to basically bust my ass in return to make him look good and to make his life easier uh, because that's the right I'm indebted. And I not that I necessarily yeah. felt that from him, like he was making me feel like that, but mm-hmm. that's just how I was. I maybe am still wired to feel that way. You know, like you go out and you go up to bat for me. I'm going to go up to bat for you as well. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's a great way to look at it. I mean, you know, that's part of the relationship is, you know, you need to make these people look good. And in turn, they, they help open doors for you. It's, it should be symbiotic where, you know, every you're it, it, it works for both of you, you know, because right. now if you come in, you're a superstar. He looks great. You know, Greg, wow, would you <laughs> find this guy? You know what I mean? And and you've now gained experience and doors will open for you. So. Um, you know, I, and he I'm got lucky. promoted too, and he would get promoted because he already had the secession plan was already there. Right. So right it, was, exactly. it was like not only did he look good, but he was good enough to get promoted. So then I got promoted. Like it worked. Right. It worked really well. I think. Yeah. Absolutely, man. And uh, yeah, I think you know you need to if you don't have those relationships. Um, identify them. You know, you, you may have them, but maybe you didn't really hone in. You know, maybe somebody did call you and, you know, you pass it over for one reason or another, like really take take stock of where you are in your career. I, I'm lucky enough to have that person. Um, you know, this lady, you know, set me up twice, twice when I was on the scrap heap. She was like, nah, bring this guy in. I know what he's about and, and, and gave me the opportunity. And the thing is, when you get it, you got to grab it. So you definitely did that. Um, a big part of why I wanted to bring you on the show, um, when first, when I found out that you're flat out almost half my age, you know, it, it could be a little, a little bit depressing. You know, I haven't made a documentary oh, yet. I'm, 
<laughs> but uh, no, in all seriousness, you, you've clearly done a lot um, at, at a young age. And, um, you know, we talked about your your college experience. And this was a, a topic that came up um, very early in in quarantine for myself. I, I, I listened to another podcast where the guest was um, clearly not advocating for hospitality school and not advocating for education. Um, it, it bothered me because this person has a large platform and, you know, to, to advocate for someone not going to get educated on the industry they want to be in is kind of irresponsible to me. Um, but clearly you're an, an example of education. It's not everything. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on this, uh, on that debate, you know? Is hospitality school necessary? Would you have done it differently? What do you think? What's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, so I got chills when you said, like, you know, I'm an example of, like, hospitality education is in everything. But I actually believe that hospitality education is everything. And I will explain mm -hmm. that, you know, for example, some people go to hospitality school, which I think is great. And actually, and I know I mentioned this to you when you were in town, but it's something that the more I go into my career, the more I'm like, wow, I would love to go to hospitality school. Mm. It's just not something that I was interested in when it was like I graduated high school and then it was time to go to school. So there's mm -hmm. that. Secondly, I value hospitality education immensely. One big example of that, which I shared was I reached out to the president of the company for the number one double tree on the planet and said, I want to learn from you. Right. I would say that's a huge, huge educational opportunity Absolutely. Um, to go and be on the ground in his hotel and, and figure out not only just ask him and figure out, hey, why is this hotel number one? And not only ask him, but ask every single employee in the building why the hotel is number one. But then also mm -hmm. see it and then to work there to get into that banquet operations, get into housekeeping, get into front office, just work and just observe and see and do and, and figure it out. So that, I think that's just one example of a mm -hmm. large piece of hospitality education. And I also, you know, I don't know how much reading I'm going to get done while I'm here at this GM, club, but in my, in my past life as a non GM of a failing hotel, I read a lot of books and I've even read hospitality management textbooks from school mm -hmm. and just read them. And like, I didn't understand everything I read, but I read it and I got through it and I just, you know, tried to read and understand what I could and just be aware. And then another thing is Hospitality MD podcast where I've talked to great people like you and other leaders in this industry who have taught me so many things that I just can't return. Like it's a gift that I am overwhelmed with how much knowledge right. I've from the amazing people that I've spoken with on the podcast. Um, so I will say that I am 100% a advocate of hospitality education. I would say that um, I just, I guess, haven't really, I, I, school just has never been necessary for me, but do I think it's interesting? Yes. Would I love to go to a hospital? Like, I seriously am so interested in it now. I'm actually, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that someone just sends me a scholarship to go to their hospitality school <laughs> and I just go and just have fun. But um, I, I I love hospitality education. I think it's critical. And I would just encourage everybody to whatever that looks like for you, whether that's reaching out, like, I mean, I'm Calvin, I'm sure you've had this happen to you, man, where people DM you on Instagram and ask you questions about, Hey, what should I do? Or I have, you know, this dilemma or whatever. I'm reaching mm -hmm. out to you as a resource, as a leader in hospitality. I would say for the person who's doing that, you are educating yourself. I've had people reach out to me all the time. Hey, you know, I have this question or I'm interested to know what your opinion is on this. I think that for those who are doing that, that's you're doing your part to educate yourself and advocate for yourself which is big. Um, so yeah, I guess my point is separating hospitality degree from hospitality education. 
Um, Great point. So that's that's kind of I think that's that's where I stand on the issue. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. I, th- I think we're pre- we're pretty much aligned there. I mean, I did uh, again go to hospitality school. I didn't go in as a hospitality major. Um, <clears throat> my dad is in the in the dental field, and you know, similar to you with your mother, that's all I saw. So when it was time to to go to college, I was good at science. I got A's in biology, and I was like, sure, I'll be a dentist. So that's what I'll do, right? I mean. It's, it's kind of odd to ask 16 year olds what they want to do for the rest of their life because that's how we make decisions. Oh, I get A's in this. I'll do that. You know, uh, but I, I got to school and um, like most people, organic chemistry busted my ass. And I realized I, yeah, I was like, this isn't, I can't pass this. This ain't going to work. So at the same time, um, I had some friends who were in, in the hospitality school. And um, our school had a pretty, um, pretty good program. We had a hotel on campus, and just listening to them talk about um, talk about the classes and stuff, and travel, and the industry has always been exciting to me because like, we we traveled a lot growing up, and I stayed at a lot of different resorts, um, but I never thought about it as a career. So now we get to you know seeing friends and stuff do this. So I I started to explore it more. What I loved about it is kind of ties in with your point. I love the fact that we could sit in a class about front office operations and then go work at the hotel the same day and get to implement what you learn immediately. That, that to me, um, I learned best that way. And that was what I loved most about the school. I don't know if I would have loved it as much if we didn't have these type of, uh, of things where you could immediately just jump in and do them. If it was all book learning, it may not have had the impact that it did. But as it stood, we had a, a hotel. You could work at the front desk. I worked in housekeeping. We had multiple events throughout the year where we actually, um, a, a, a big fundraiser for the school, um, where you would get these local people to come and donate to scholarships and things like that, was all run by the uh, hospitality students where we, we ordered the food, we, we, we cooked it, we served, we, we cleaned up. You know, we did everything. We ran, and there was a general manager of of that operation of of that event. Each uh, a student would get nominated to do right. that. Um, we had classes where people would really come in and and have lunch, actual paying guests from from the neighborhood. So we 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 ran a restaurant. You know, so this is where you learn all of these things. And you know, so when I get into the workforce at twenty twenty one years old. I have all this experience. So when you go back to the conversation about, you know, have you ever worked in operations? This is something I get a lot because I spent most of my career in, in revenue management. It's like, yeah, I had five years of experience before I even had my first job. Yeah. yeah. I actually, that's what I envy most about like people who've gone to hospitality school is like, I don't know very much about food and beverage, for example. Um, very, very little because I've spent most of my career in rooms. So I think, I think working in a position in a hotel gives you, and I don't know, maybe you can disagree with this. I'm just spouting right now, but I think working in a industry or in a position in, in a hotel gives you depth. Mm-hmm. Hospitality school gives you breadth that you can yeah. take with you to whichever you get the breadth first and then you could decide where do you want to go? and dive deeper into and i wish i just i i would love to have had like just enough of that nuance from hospitality school to take to you know even my role right now as the gm i i wish i had hospitality school on my in my backpack as i Mm -hmm. come into this job um so yeah i don't know i Mm -hmm. hospitality school is really really fascinating to me and i i I honestly just encourage everybody to do it at this point like but if you don't if for some reason you don't want to or maybe you do but you can't afford it or whatever the case might be just know that it's not the only option uh to educate yourself in this industry especially now like literally just send me a dm on linkedin or instagram send calvin a dm like you're going to get educated one way or another from somebody somehow read a book, go on YouTube, Mm -hmm. reach out to the president of that 
number one hotel that you want to talk to and make a documentary about them. <laughs> There's more than one way to skin a yeah. cat, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I just want to drive home one point before we move on to the next thing is, you know, the hospitality school experience, what it did was expose me to everything. Right. And, you know, in addition to that is every summer you're encouraged to go do an internship. It basically just means get a summer job. Right. But th through that, I worked at uh, front desk at different hotels, or I worked at a restaurant and waited tables or bartended, you know, for, for the whole summer. And, you know, it opened one thing I left sometimes, you know, what they tell you with internships is sometimes you learn what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. I knew I was not an F and B guy. I was never going to work in a kitchen. Okay. I just don't have, I love food. I don't need to cook it. <laughs> right. I also didn't like working with chefs. They're very temperamental people. This is not for me. Is <laughs> is is not is not my lane, right? But that's something that I would have that I learned through experience of of going to school, right? Or or through internships. So, you know, your point about about breadth and depth is is 100% right is you you will get you'll get exposed to all parts of the business, then it's up to you to kind of pick and choose where you think you fit. And as your, your career develops, being open to learning from other departments is, is something that's, that's also going to move you forward, which brings me into something else I wanted to, to talk to you about. You know, being a, you're the uh, operations guy and I was more of a revenue guy. Um, I know you're aware of the conversation that was on my page recently, uh, which kind of devolved into a, you know, ops versus sales beef, which happens all too often. Um, in the industry, in because that was not the intent of, of of the post. So, for those who know what I'm talking about, I'll clarify it here. Um, the conversation was uh, it was a, a poll question on LinkedIn uh, by Ken Patel, and he he asked if when the hotel maximizes revenue, who gets the most credit? And hospital um, housekeeping and front desk got twice the amount of votes as sales, which to me is just mind boggling because that's just not how the business works. Um, my mind went to the leadership in the industry because these were the people who were voting on right. the poll. And um, if these people don't understand where the money comes from at this point, especially post COVID, I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> you know, I but, feel like I, I really do feel like at this point, the front desk and housekeeping answer is is kind of like the the just the soft uh, kind of just euphemism, I guess. Like it's been a tough time with COVID, right? And mm -hmm. operations has been hit so hard, and I feel like this is kind of the but so of sales, right? So of sales. And well, let's yeah. not forget that. So of sales, so of revenue. So, right. um, but as we, as the hotels have continued to operate in the absence of salespeople, in the absence of revenue managers and front desk and housekeeping, basically just the meat and potatoes of the rooms division, which is really the only thing that hotels have been. And, you know, now that's changing, but, um, I think they've taken such a, a hard beating that leaders in the industry are like almost their, their mind has shifted. Like, I wonder mm -hmm. if those poll results would have been the same in, uh, in 2018 when we were on this hot streak, the industry was doing great. Um, because now it's almost like to a certain extent, if you can't clean your rooms, which is a real concern now more so than it was previously, mm -hmm you won't make any money. Or if you don't right. have anybody to check in those people, you won't make any money. So I understand where that sentiment is coming from in context with what the industry is facing right now. Mm -hmm. But I do think, and I did say this to you on Instagram, that you are correct. Revenue is maximized by sales and revenue. That's their job. That is their only <laughs> job. That see, I, I I'm glad that the ops person said it, so now it doesn't sound biased because that's that's yeah. what I said. It's like that's literally all we're here to do is bring money in and maximize it, right? So how could a, another department get more credit for that goal than revenue? It would be like me as a revenue manager saying, "Well, when we hit 
number one in, in guest service scores that I should get more credit. Why? <laughs> because because when I put the rates out there, they're they're accurate. When when I create a new package, everything is accurate, so the guest ha- doesn't have anything to complain about when they get to the front desk. That sounds moronic, doesn't it? But it's, it's the same. It's a stretch. Man. It's a huge stretch, <laughs> you know. This, but this is basically the argument of trying to say that a housekeeper has more impact on maximizing revenue than the salesperson who's who's out there chasing leads and, and bringing groups in all day. It just it doesn't make sense. And I I in my experience, I do think that I don't know if it would have been quite thirty to sixteen as it was, but it probably would have been closer to even even a few years ago, because it's something I've dealt with in my career, dealing with these more old school type of general managers who, um, you know, they love to say, oh, ops, ops is the heart and soul of the house, which I'm not really arguing, but it's not the heart and soul of the revenue, which is what keeps the lights on. And, you know, that, that, um, that boss of mine that I referenced earlier in the show, the one who really taught me revenue, she told me that, if we don't do our jobs, people lose theirs. And I've never forgotten it and always gone about my work with that pressure on my back. Like we need to hit these numbers so those people upstairs can keep working, All right? So at, having gone through a year and a half of empty hotels and shutdowns and all of this stuff, the fact that the leadership of this industry felt so compelled to not give the credit to the people who are bringing it in is is a problem for me in a couple of ways because now you're you're going above and beyond to try to make ops feel appreciated which I understand the sentiment behind that right. but but by doing what you did you're now telling your you basically spit in the face of the salesperson who have done a lot of the things that ops people have done over the pandemic I know multiple directors of sales who have worked the front desk and 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 clean rooms while having to sell over the past year and a half. So now these people are feeling unappreciated. And someone commented to me on LinkedIn during the conversation that they said if if as a leader you're not thanking your housekeeping and, and front front desk teams, you're doing something wrong. I would take it as a step further and say if all of your departments don't feel respected for what they're doing you're absolutely doing something wrong. And and yeah, I would agree because you're absolutely right. That director of sales, who's an executive committee member of the hotel, typically, well, in really all cases, mm-hmm. has cleaned rooms during the pandemic, has done all that stuff while still bringing in business. And to just invalidate that, or even if they didn't clean rooms, it's fine because they're not supposed to. That's right. not their job. And that's okay that it's not their job because I'm sure that if you said to a room attendant, Hey, do you want to be in constant contact with guests 24, seven, seven days a week at their beck and call for whatever they need to secure deals that if you don't close, you could lose your job and basically just have this all this pressure and never clock out and all this stuff would you want to do it they would say no probably in a lot of cases and that's the life of a director of sales it's okay to say that there are two different types of jobs it's okay to, if you don't clean rooms that doesn't mean that you're not a team player that just means that it's not your job right so mm-hmm. that director of sales they deserve to be recognized just for doing their job that's enough that's enough Amen. they're doing a exactly. great job well, at least you, you hope so. So they're right. doing a good job. They should be recognized for it regardless of what that job is. Exactly. And yeah, it is a, it's a slap in the face to sales, to revenue. To say that, again, I empathize with, this, with the context surrounding the results of that poll. But mm-hmm. do I think that it's fair? No. And I'm an ops guy. guy. You're hearing it right here. We both agree um, that it... it Give credit where credit is due. Sales deserves the credit for bringing in revenue. They really do. That's yeah. That's that's all it boils down to. Uh, you know, again, if the tables were turned, any department would want their just credit for for what they did and wouldn't want to give them to someone else. Um, that really was the the crux of the conversation. So I'm 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 glad that you 
you simplified it and you know now I've got you on record as an ops guy agreeing with me it's 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 you know I'm I'm not I'm not being a biased revenue dude here you know I actually care about the industry and again I've done I've done pretty much all the jobs right I, you know it's just from a leadership standpoint we need to we need to make sure everybody feels you know respected and I think I'll just take a step further I think there's there's too many old school leaders in this industry too many people who are back from the days before you know OTA business and where you could just flick on a vacancy switch and people show it up it doesn't work like that anymore those guests don't show up to the front desk by accident it takes a lot of work to get them there and it's high time there's more leaders in we have a higher percentage of leaders that understand that and because I can tell you I've heard from people who are leaving the industry salespeople that said you know what this is the reason why I left or why I'm leaving you go losing good people because we don't want to recognize them and that's that's a a real tangible negative result of prolonged inaccurate sentiments like what like I think like the poll is is just kind of uh, that you that you reference that kind of sparks this conversation is just one manifestation of what's taking place at hotels all around the country. Yeah, absolutely. So wake up. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. All right, so let's uh, go into our, our last couple of segments here. Um, what was your aha moment? as uh, in, in your career, you know, it could be anything you want, anything that maybe inspired a change or um, the moment you knew you were on the right path, whatever that means to you. Um, my aha moment was when I interviewed Craig Poole on my podcast for the first time before I went and saw his hotel. But when I interviewed him mm -hmm. on the podcast, it was, that was the moment that I was, felt like I had permission to believe what I believed. It fe I felt validated. I felt just, it felt good. Um, and the reason I say that is because I believe a lot of the things that he believes about hotels are more than just a cash flow. They're a major component to every community and they should be operated as such. And um, throughout my career, I didn't know anybody like Craig and I didn't know that and I, I thought I was the only one who believed those things because I had been told by my leaders that that's impractical or that's incorrect or that um, the only thing that matters is labor productivity or just these things that really don't matter at the end of the day. Um, right. And then I talked to Craig on this podcast and realized that he was more successful than everybody else and did it all for the right reasons and with integrity and in the true spirit of hospitality. And that was my definite aha moment. And then I just catapulted awesome. him there as I met him in person multiple times, saw his hotel, studied him and made a film about him. Um, but hearing his philosophy for the first time and really talking with him for the first time was my aha moment. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. So now wrapping up with our final segment, uh, something I like to call, I don't want to brag because most of us don't like to brag you know it's 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 not it's not becoming but i'm going to put you on the spot and <clears throat> have you tell us what is the proudest achievement in your career one of the i mean i'm really proud of the documentary that we made i'm really proud of it um mm -hmm. it's was really just so meaningful to me personally. And I think it impacted a lot of people and it's still the beginning. We just, we just premiered it. We, like I said earlier, we have festivals that we're going to be doing and hopefully distribution. So I'm very proud of it. I, I want to see it do well. It's my baby. Um, so I don't want to brag, but <laughs> I made a pretty good documentary, I think. Um, and then Love it. secondly, I don't want to brag, but um, you know, I'm a GM, I'm 23. Um, I have this huge turnaround project ahead of me that's, you know, on my shoulders and, um, you know, I haven't done anything yet. I, I could fail. Um, but being here with the honor to 
have the privilege of potentially trying to fix it means a lot mm -hmm. to me. Um, yeah. So that's that's big for me, and I'm keeping that as my north star as I try and navigate this very very difficult challenge. Um, being a first time GM um, in a completely different city without any <laughs> any family or friends that I know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and taking on the worst hotel in the brand. So it's uh, it's humbling and it's it's an honor. Um, and yeah, I don't want to brag, but I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Listen, if if I were to pick the one or two for you, it would be those. I mean, you know, you mentioned a 23 year old GM. There's not not too many people, um, you know, get to that level in their career. And you're already here at 23 and it's virtually the beginning. You know, um, yeah, it is. Not, it is the beginning. Yeah. I haven't done anything yet. I really, I really believe that. Um, once I, if I turn around this hotel, which I really hope I do, because <laughs> my reputation is on the line here, guys. But yeah, <laughs> I want to. I'll manifest it into existence when I turn around this hotel. Exactly. I think there you go. Be, that will be the beginning. That will be the beginning. Um, yeah. So it's it's it's. This is it, guys. We're here. It's ground zero. Uh, mm -hmm. just just ready to see what happens yeah well we're excited to uh, to follow your story man um i know i'm excited to see what you do there i know you're gonna you're gonna do it i know you're gonna turn that hotel around um you know if we we've known each other only a few months really you know yeah. it started from that meme and then we chatted on your podcast and same feeling you had about craig i had about you i was like this guy gets it this guy gets hospitality and um be, you know that was is is what's going to going to take you places and 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 that passion and that knowledge of what hospitality is supposed to be you you're going to deliver it and as long as you deliver authentic hospitality to people they have no choice but to like it because that's what the industry is all about so well and you know i think that's that's a great sentiment and i'll leave the listeners with this never forget why we do this never forget why we're here whether your sales revenue housekeeping, front desk, engineering, valet, whoever you are, don't forget why we're here. This is the best industry in the world to make people's lives better. Um, and uh, yeah, it's all about hospitality and that's, that's the main thing. Got that right, buddy. All right, so uh, thank you for a great conversation, man. As always, we always have a good time, uh, you know, talking hospitality and, um, I think our listeners will get a lot out of your story uh, about your career. And, um, you know, we, we wish you continued success here. And uh, why don't you let the people know where they where they can find you? Well, guys, and Calvin, thank you again. I love the new show. Looking forward to, uh, to, to uh, more episodes. And for everybody listening, thanks for making it this far. Thank you for, uh, for tuning in and for hearing me talk. Uh, you can hear me talk more. If you're not already sick of me on the Hospitality MD podcast, uh, just you could actually just search uh, solo.to slash hospitality MD for all of the social media channels Instagram, podcast, YouTube, my LinkedIn page, um, or just search my name, Kyle Allison, on LinkedIn. You'll find me there. Um, yeah, it's Hospitality MD and, and me. So, Search me, find me, listen to my show, <laughs> and uh, keep listening to Calvin. Keep supporting him because he's the man too. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, of course, with the perfect introduction, uh, my name is Calvin Taloki. You can find me on LinkedIn and uh, follow us on Instagram at the G dot spot for more uh, career tips and uh, more of what you heard here today on our show. So we will see you next time.